evening, everyone. Um, my name is Alexandra Sinaitis, and I am the Assistant Director for Programming and Public Engagement at the UF Center for Humanities and the Public Sphere. It is a pleasure, it's an honor to welcome you to Suppress Narrative, All History, Cookbooks, and Museum, um, the third event of Conversation Neighborhood, a public humanities series that addresses questions raised by food consumption and production at a moment in which a global pandemic challenges our, our physical and social connection. Since I also, since I told you who I am, I will also love to know who you are and where you are coming from. If you could say so in the chat box, I will really appreciate it. So before we get started, I would like to take the center staff, Barbara Menno, Sophia Acord, Kristen Galvin, Lauren Cox. I also would like to take my collaborators, Tanisha Marshall, Benjamin Howard, D1 Courtney from the Office of Equity and Inclusion in the city of Gainesville, and Wolf from Gainesville Regional Utilities, Manuela Calissi, Imani Selvin, and Chris. I also would like to take the Florida Humanities Council, which provided funding for this program through our grants with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities. I would like to say that any views, finding, conclusion, or recommendation expressed in this program do not necessarily represent those of Florida Humanities Council or the National Endowment for Humanities. Lastly, I would like to take our sponsors, the Chief Diversity Officer, the UF Center for Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies Research, the UF Department of Spanish and Portuguese Studies, the UF Center for American Studies, the UF Samuel Pro Pro Proctor Oral History Program, the UF Center for African Studies, the UF African American Studies Program, the UF Language, Literature and Culture, the UF Center for European Studies, the UF International Center, the UF Center for Arts, Migration and Entrepreneurship, and the UF Office of Sustainability. Just a little housekeeping, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. I'll bring them up during the webinar and we'll have time for questions at the end. So now without further ado, I will turn this over to Dr. Delia Severinsen, an assistant professor of African American literature at the University of Florida. Her current book project explores the nuances of how race and disability inform identity in 19th and 20th century African American literature. She has published in the Journal of American Culture and the South Carolina Review. Currently, she's developing a biography and a reader on the late Dolores Phillips, poet and author of The Darkest Child. Thanks, Alexandra, and thank all of you all for being here today. As Alexandra was saying, if you do have, we welcome questions. So please put the questions in the Q&A and um, our panelists will be more than happy, I can say, for these questions. I wanna introduce this lovely panel that we have today. And if you could, as I say your name, if you could also um, give a, uh, um, a physical cue, that would be great as well. First, we have Dr. Katherine Dolan, who teaches US Lit at Literature at, the, at Missouri University of Science and Technology. And she focuses on food studies, global studies, and environmental criticism. She has currently finished a project that researches the role of cattle in 19th century US expansion as described in the literatures of the period. The name of her manuscript, Cattle Country, Livestock in the Cultural Imagination, will be published by the University of Nebraska Press in June, 2021. She's currently working on a book studying the global histories of breakfast cereal through Reaction Press. Next, we have Ms. Vivian Fowler, who is a retired professor of nursing from Santa Fe College here in Gainesville, Florida. She has worked as a nursing assistant at Shan's Teaching Hospital, various positions as an RN, as well as professor of nursing and interim director of health sciences at Santa Fe College. She obtained a bachelor of science from the University of Florida, a master's degree in education from Nova University, and a master of nursing degree from the University of South Florida. After her 26 years at Santa Fe College, she retired and is now the CEO of the Cotton Club, a nonprofit museum and cultural center of which she will talk about later on. Fowler has spent most of her life as a wife and mother of two sons and a grandmother of four grandchildren. Her hobbies include telling African-American stories and singing with the Washington sisters and acapella trio along with her two sisters. Thanks, Ms. Fowler. Dr. Portia Moore. 
is department head and assistant professor of museum studies at the University of Florida in the School of Art and Art History. She is a critical race scholar interrogating the, rule, the role and function of race in museums and the cultural heritage sector. She is the co-creator of the Visitors of Color Project. Dr. Moore speaks internationally on issues of race, equity, and inclusion. She writes frequently on race, racial equality, and inclusion in museums and the cultural heritage sector. Her most recent publications include chapters in editor Richard Sandel's Museum Activism, published in 2019. And she has several forthcoming chapters in books and journal publications. She previously served as inclusion catalyst at the Columbia Museum of Art, where she also worked as a consulting curator of African-American art for the Spoken Rotating Art Gallery. She served as project advisor for Mass Action, one uh, as one of the founding architects for museums and race. Her most critical role is serving as critical race futurist for Inclusium, where she assists in a multitude of functions such as regular contributing writer and project advisor. She has partnered with museums nationally and internationally on education, training, and workshops on race and, race and anti-racism in museums. You can also follow her on Twitter. Her handle is at Portia Muse M. I'm going to drop it in the chat or I'll have Dr. Moore actually or Portia drop it in the chat if you can as well. Last but not least, we have Ms. Dixie Nielsen who received her BA in history from Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida and a master's degree in museum studies from Johns Hopkins University. Her 30 years of museum experience began at the University of Florida campus at the Harn Museum of Art in 1990. She was the museum's head registrar responsible for the museum's collections. In 2000, Dixie became the first instructor in US museum studies program where she taught and advised students until 2016. She has been an <clears throat> active member in the Southeastern Registrars Association and she was chair from 95 to 2000 as well as served on the board of the American Alliance of Museums as museum liaison. Since 2019, she has been the executive director of the Matheson History Museum. I would like to give a warm welcome to all of our wonderful panelists. Thank you for being here with us. Um, the structure of this panel will, I think for a few minutes, I want us just to talk about generally um, Southern food. And then each panelist will have time to talk about their expertise in relation to Southern food ways and culture. And then we will wrap the um, uh, we will wrap the event up by having a question and answer and regrouping. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, what Southern food is, what it means to each one of you, because even in thinking about what the South is, people, there is no consensus about what Southern is itself, right? I mean, is it where home fries meets grits? Is that the dividing line? You know, I mean, so, so when we're thinking about the South, what does Southern food mean to you? Well, I will say that for me, you know, I'm born and raised in South Carolina in the peak from, I'm from the PD region, which is that region right before you hit the coast. Uh, both sides of my family were tobacco farmers. So I am a truly Southern girl. So for me, Southern food though is about storytelling and it is about narrative and it is about memory. So it is the ways in which we use food to come together to create community, but also to, to continue to share our family memories. Um, I think I'll leave it at that. And for me, my, my favorite Southern food is definitely mustard greens and turnips, turnip roots. <laughs> yeah, I, I like certainly what you're saying because uh, Southern food, we I want people to really understand the Southern food is a black heritage thing. We brought from Africa, our African foods that we mixed with the European foods and the native um, um, American foods and created those dishes that have become Southern food. I had this con conversation with a person who, uh, who really thought he was gonna put his foot on me. He said, I don't know why they call it Southern food. We all cook the same food. 
he did not realize that yes, you cook it, but the heritage of it came mm -hmm. from African people and Native American people and the combination of European. And the African people were the ones who put these cuisines together to, and we're still eating some of those things mm -hmm. now. So to me, that food means warmth. It means comfort. It means heritage. It means connection. It means I came from somewhere. Mm -hmm. I belong somewhere. Mm -hmm. I am somebody. So I don't care who, what you call it anywhere. And I don't care if the Colonel calls it his fried chicken. I just care that you realize that we all say, we all say, um, enjoy it, but it did have a heritage. And that was tied up in the African American heritage. And I think that's worth mentioning. I think we've given away too much of our history and we don't, we're not cognizant enough of it to pass it on. And that's what I think is very important. I certainly do like collard greens. <laughs> collard greens and sweet potatoes. All right. Yes. Thank you. DC or Catherine, what do you all think about um, what Southern food is or ain't? <laughs> I, I was thinking about this a lot and I can't imagine Southern food being eaten alone. Jim, mm -hmm. Something that you make with your family, for your family, you have a gang of people around you. And, and like uh, Ms. Filer, I think it means family and warmth and, and happiness. Mm -hmm. it, maybe it means having to diet a little bit afterwards, but I sure <laughs> like sweet potato pie with marshmallows and bourbon. <laughs> oh, you got fancy. Yes. <laughs> Well, not that much bourbon. <laughs> um, and I am going to drop a quote into the chat box because that is the kind of person I am. Um, there's, I'm, a, I'm kind of coming from the outside. I'm not a native Southerner. I did a postdoc in Florida and now I'm in Missouri. So I'm kind of entering the South now communication wise, but I'm originally from the West. So, but this this Brian Terry quote, I think, really captures my idea of it, that there's just this need to reclaim a lot of the culture involved in Southern food. And notice especially his number three there, the recognizing the centrality of the African diasporic people in helping to find the tastes, ingredients, and classic dishes of, and I love this part, the original modern global fusion cuisine. And you know, fusion is so popular right now and everyone talks about fusion, um, but really it's always been, Southern food has always been a fusion inherently to itself. So that's where I think of with Southern food. And of course, anything sweet potato. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, I see many of you all talk about, you know, the relationship between, as Dixie was saying, like it's not meant to be eaten by itself. And as Ms. Fowler was saying, there's a heritage to it. Portia, you use the word storytelling. Can you all talk about a specific dish that, um, or a, a memory that you have specifically around Southern food? and how that influences what you think about Southern identity is or Southern food, the relationship between Southern food and culture. Well, I wanna go way back. I'll start this because I am in the era when the old folks went to the church in the country and mm -hmm. put up the two uh, side table, the, the, the board that was a table and laid out the food. So there was potato salad and collard greens and mustard greens and everything you could think of because after service, everybody in the church and all around came to eat this awesome yeah. food. So there was a, there was assembling of everybody and it did not matter who you belong to, everybody belonged to that group at that time. Mm -hmm. So I think that's very important. Uh, and I have dishes that are, my mother was by the way, a chef. She wasn't called that because she's black and in this place had mm -hmm. a chef, but she certainly was at the top of the ladder. And her thing was the bread pudding. And uh, she could make it like no one else makes it. I tried, but I'm not quite that good yet. But there were a lot of foods that we enjoyed, but and several of them, but I, I really remember her for that one. I would say that my all of my food memories, um, particularly, you know, when I think about my, I mean, I say my upbringing, but I mean, even now, my food memories are very, very connected to the fact that on both sides of our family, we 
not only owned land, but everyone around us had access to land, which actually is not very common for Black people. Um, we had, you know, a lot of a lot of acreage. So all of the things I remember growing up, um, my mother, my grandmother had what she called her garden, but it was actually several acres where mm. she grew, um, you know, cucumbers, tomatoes, corn. Uh, we would watch the deer come and nibble on her things. The rabbits come and nibble on her things. We would watch um, all of the men and boys go hunting for deer, go hunting for turkey, go hunting for um, even sometimes rabbit. Um, you know, I grew up with on certain Sundays, the women would go and wring the necks of the chicken. We'd have fried chicken. Uh, we would brew tea in the sun. Mm -hmm. we, would, um, we would watch the men go and kill a hog and then roast it in the pit. And, you know, everyone was really clear about technique, how you season things, the preparation of the food. So for me, the food memories are always connected to um, access to land and again, mm -hmm. storytelling. And just like everyone is saying, you're, you're not doing any of these things alone. So even if you're sitting in the house and all of a sudden your grandma produces this giant bowl with peas in it, everyone's mm -hmm. now going to sit on the porch and shell these peas. <laughs> so for me, um, it, you know, it's about access to land, which then provides uh, safety, which provides recreation, which provides sustainability, which provides in a lot of ways liberation. You know, if you can feed yourself, if you can um, sustain yourself, if you can come together in community, then you're happy, you're whole, and you're free. And so my memories with food, again, are, are associated with, with all of these different things that I'm, that I'm really grateful and appreciative that I have that experience and that history. And I'd love to jump on, on that and, and add help. Mm -hmm. Like having access to fresh food in so many ways is something that's denied so many people as well. And, and so already you're healthier and you don't have the, a lot of those diseases that disproportionately hit populations, diabetes, heart disease, stuff like that, because, yeah. and it's largely because you have access to the whole foods and it, it's not getting super processed by the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love that you said that because I remember so vividly, we didn't, we only really went to the store on the weekends for my grandmother if we needed to buy dry goods like flour mm -hmm. or sugar. But even that we had cane syrup. Mm -hmm. um, if, if anyone started to sniffle a little bit, we would have elders that would go out in the woods and get what we call catnip tea. So yes. we would look for a certain herb. So we grew mm -hmm. up, if, or black draught, or you know, certain things that you get from the from the woods, literally, mm -hmm. or from the, your yard that you could bring back and brew. So we were mm -hmm. very healthy. We had well water. Mm -hmm. um, we did. We rarely got sick, and we didn't eat a lot of processed, packaged meats or foods. Anything. All of the sausages and meat and everything that we ate. All of the fish came from either things that we caught or things that other people caught or hunted. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of food memories happen spontaneously. We don't plan to sit down and talk about these things, but there's a memory that I always have of my mother talking about my grandmother. And she would say, well, you know, my mom didn't have a lot of money. She had seven kids and she raised them by herself. And so she really had to count her pennies all the time. But the one thing that she insisted on when she made any kind of baked goods, she had to have real vanilla, not imitation mm -hmm. vanilla, not any of that stuff. And, and, I, and it always made me feel like um, I, I, I saw this image of this woman counting pennies, but using them to buy the best ingredients she could to share with her family. And I can never bake uh, without thinking of that, especially, and I have to use real vanilla. <laughs> I, I want to say also, uh, Portia, you talked about uh, always having the food and sharing it. We also, when we cooked, we made sure there was enough cooked food in case somebody stopped by and yeah. they were headed someplace they were traveling. We didn't have restaurants. So if mm -hmm. you were in somebody's home, you're going to get a bed to sleep in and a meal to eat. And they would just pull it out of uh, whatever the icebox was and prepare it. And, and I lived in neighborhoods. We lived in a very poor neighborhood. I, I always say we grew up with, quote, poor, but we never knew we were. 
because our parents and our neighbors and all treated us so well and we were raised so well, but we would, we would have fit in that. And my dad owned land at one point, but we, we eventually did not own that. But mm -hmm. if you needed a cup of flour, you could send two eggs next door and exchange <laughs> them for two for a cup of flour. Yeah. That's how I grew up. I grew up doing the same thing. If we need a little sugar, you go knock on your neighbor's door. I yeah. will also say too, Miss um, Miss Fowler, that <laughs> you bring up such a good point because if you were rooted in the church, which yes. you likely were if you're from the South, yes. then you know at church on Sunday, they read the sick and shut in list. And if you hear that your neighbor is sick and shut in, you yes. automatically are gonna put a plate aside or plates aside right. for not only that sick person, but their caregivers. Yeah. So that was another part of our tradition is that you're making more than enough food. Even if you don't have a whole lot, you're still mm -hmm. making enough to then share with someone else. And that's that's a tradition that still goes on. Mm -hmm. I think what you all are getting at is even though, you know, there might be specific um, differences between what one might call the deep south or versus Appalachia or, or things like that, what is a foundational here is is the relationship between food and community um and i think that each one of you all are going to in, in talk about with your own personal comments here the relationship between the south food culture community and first we're going to have Catherine tell us about um relationships between cookbooks and southern storytelling and cooking uh, yes, thank you. Um, and I have some slides. I, I hope they're not too tedious, but that's so if we can transition over to the slides. I guess I'll just say next slide when we get there. So um, yeah, so next slide, please. So the history of cookbooks, and I, I start broad because the, the first cookbooks actually in the US do start in Virginia, but they're originally just reproducing what we had from the UK. We're still considered British at this point. And so uh, notice 1742, you get um, this guy, William Parks is starting to publish a cookbook that's a reprint of this uh, Complete Housewife um, that was originally published in London in 1727. It's not until later, 1796, which if you think about it is 20 years after the revolution, where this American cookery gets published, Amelia Simmons's book, um, and that's up in Hartford, Connecticut. That's the first that gets iconic, you know, that's kind of iconically the first American cookbook. And it, so it's not specifically Southern, but she does talk about specifically American ingredients. So we get, we see corn for the first time, we see pumpkins for the first time in a cookbook. So before then, Americans had been trying to replicate, Americans that had access, had been trying to replicate British recipes, but you you know sometimes they weren't able to because we didn't have British foodstuffs. And so, how do you incorporate American foodstuffs? So this is the first time that that becomes a thing. Um, next slide, please. Here's a lovely image of them. Uh, and then yeah, next slide. Um, so then throughout the 19th century, which is my specific little area, um, they gain in popularity. What happens is people. Uh, sp specifically in the North cities, also happening a bit in the South. Um, there's different situations in the South, of course, um, are moving into the cities and they're not learning at the hands of their, you know, elder generations anymore. And so they need these printed recipes now because they don't have the oral tradition so much as had been traditional. And so um, two examples, the, the first Southern cookbook that gets published at this time is the Virginia Housewife. It's 1824. So again, it's um, about 50 years after, 30 years after that other one, um, Mary Randolph. So this has a French influence. Again, it's global fusion. All this kind of stuff is contributing to the tastes and flavors of the, this region thought of as the, that's the South. Um, but it introduces things like catfish, okra, and gumbo. And look at how she's spelling okra there. <laughs> and uh, then the House Servants Dictionary uh, Directory is the first black published, published by an African American cookbook. And it's more of a like a butler's how to prepare, how to serve, how to you know uh, accomplish a, a lovely household kind of a cookbook. So it's not technically a southern cookbook. Um, the next slide has a couple of examples from that Virginia housewife. 
ooh, that we're not gonna be able to see. But yeah, there's a, there's a catfish recipe there and there's an okra recipe there. And what I wanna point out in these is notice that there aren't, the, what we would think of in recipes, the ingredient list, a cup of this, a pin, you know, a, a teaspoon of that. This is, we don't realize yet that we need that detail. <laughs> they're transitioning from oral into print at this point still. And so they're saying things like, start in the morning, put a couple of handfuls of this and then just sit and look until it's done. You know, So there's an assumption that you know what to do and then it'll become more clear that people really don't. And so that will get more detailed in the directions as it goes. Um, so that's a couple of examples there. It's more narrative in the early ones. Um, next slide is a quick example from um, the, the Boston one about how to prepare how to buy things so going to market what how you will look and see what a good piece of veal is or a good you know something like that so again it's teaching people stuff that folks are, originally folks would have known how to do that because they would have followed their parents along you know and that kind of thing but now it's getting a little more separated and so there's more of a need to have written instruction um and i think a couple more slides one more slide um, so tradi again, traditionally they're getting passed down generationally, but um, the, so the Lowell Textile Mill, 1813, is a big move in U.S. history in terms of m people moving from the home base and moving to another centralized location. What becomes urbanization and cities and um, the big urban centers um away from the family home so then cookbooks are learning how to give things like quantities specifics set your oven to this temperature this many minutes stick a thermometer in there you know all that kind of stuff that kind of specificity has to become more and more precise um and then in addition of course african americans in the south have to contend with slavery and then continuing with racism and an inability to access cookbooks and an ability to read um, the ingredients. And so um, recipes get passed down orally for longer um, than with the white population there um, because, because it's just that that's how they're kind of forced to be. But then of course they have a power there too that's usually one of the most powerful personages is the cook as well. Um, so it's this fraught moment. Um, all right. A couple more slides. Next slide, please. Um, here is a very nice video. Uh, the next slide, I believe it is, has a bunch of references. I just, I'm all about just wanting to give you guys lots of references for, um, to look at in your own time. So this is the Southern Foodways is a nice site and they have a really good um, video clip about the, the history and the community of black women and the backbone of Southern food and um, there's a Natchez Heritage School of Cooking, so in Mississippi, um, and they had a, a, so there's a link there if you have time later. Um, I think one more slide. So here is some other examples. So um, one of the first um, former enslaved women to publish a cookbook is this What Miss Fisher Knows About Old Southern Cooking. So she had been born in slavery and then she moved to San Francisco and she dictates her cookbook. Um, so, and then they, that gets into to be a published cookbook. Another one is La Cuisine Creole, La Cario Hearn. That brings in the Creole New Orleans cooking. And of course that has such a cachet and that becomes so popular. And so in the late 19th century, and then the quote that I pulled earlier, this 21st century, this is right now home cookbook, um, Brian Terry's Afro Vegan is a personal favorite of mine. And then here's a couple of really cool websites I use a lot. Um, Feeding America is run out of Michigan State University and there's their website. And then the Southern Foodways Alliance is that video clip I was telling you about before. And that is their website as well. So just some resources to think about in terms of cookbooks and where they, the history there that brought us and how they relate to the South. Thank you, Catherine. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think Portia as well is going to relate um, some cookbooks um, in terms of museum studies and how museums can work um, to change, sustain um, Southern food narratives. So Portia. All right, thank you. So this is my favorite topic. I'm going to try to keep it in the time, but this is like my geek out. So a po stop me, do the Sandman. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to share, just on a personal note, is that in the last 
couple of years, I've been really trying to focus on, first of all, I love cookbooks. Let me just say that. I grew up in a home where we didn't necessarily have cookbooks, but we had um, a box that my mother would keep in the kitchen that she would write recipes down on a card. Mm -hmm. So we would yeah. have cards that she would handwrite, or sometimes she would share cards with other women would, you know, give her a card. So I have that. I have my mother's recipe box. We, we do have little sort of um, personalized sort of paper versions of cookbooks that we have, but not a whole lot of those. So that I was, you know, my, my dad is a wonderful cook. My mom was a wonderful cook and all of the men in the family are wonderful chefs. So I grew up in like, you know, homes with people who can really cook. I love to cook. So mm -hmm. I felt that to say what I started to realize, um, I lost, you know, my mothers, a couple of my, you know, my mom, women who raised me, my, my, a lot of my elders. And what I came to realize, you know, my grandmother on Sundays would make like three and four cakes, no recipe from her mind, whip it up. She'd make it and everyone would come from all over to get her cake. She would make hog head cheese, no recipe. <laughs> see the big hog head sitting in the pot. She put in peppers and vinegar and all this stuff. Um, but what it, it really became clear to me as I started to follow more people like Michael Twitty, um, you know, just like Dr. Uh, Catherine is saying, someone like Bryant Terry, who is someone I absolutely love. When I started to look at, um, someone like Dr. David Shields, people who are actually doing really rich uh, culinary historic work, people who are not only looking at um, land and food justice and looking at food apartheid, but also looking at heirloom grains, right? People like Chef BJ Dennis, who's you know helping to bring back the African red pea or the Sapelo purple uh, sugar cane on Sapelo Island. People like um, Jermaine Jenkins, who has this book called Cooking Jones, so I say all that to say what I started to realize the, that there's an actual importance in being intentional about collecting and preserving cookbooks from Black people, regardless of gender, because it is not only um, important to keep those memories alive, but it's an actual historical record. So I have started to um, intentionally collect cookbooks. I have beloved dear friends. My friend uh, Mache sent me this. Um, it is, again, Jermaine Jenkins and her husband own an amazing farm in North Charleston. It's called Fresh Future Farm. I'll read to you the back. It says, the farm applies a multi-pronged strategy that addresses health, wealth, and quality of life issues where people live. <clears throat> Through this cookbook, we hope to reignite passion for home cooking, history, and ingredients grown for and by the people to end food apartheid there in uh, North Charleston, but really everywhere. You should be following um, Jermaine if you're not following her. This is an amazing cookbook. It has recipes and it really is a cookbook that is focused on promoting um, food literacy, which is something that all of us need. We need to understand the ways in which you um, grow your own healthy food, that you understand what health and nutrition is. The other book that I have that is my beloved book is um, Vibration Cooking or The Travel Notes of a Geechee Girl by Verda Mae Smart Grobsner. If you don't know her, you also, also should know her. This is an important cookbook for anyone to have. It is a cookbook and memoir. She's one of the first people who's recognized as writing a cookbook that is preserving the history and culture of Gullah people. Um, another person that I love, I don't have her cookbook handy, um, is Edna Lewis. If you follow, my favorite person I love to follow is Vivian Howard. Vivian Howard has a new show, I forgot what it's called, but she, one of her first episodes or two are on, you know, giving reverence to Edna Lewis. She's, you know, credited as one of the first Black women. She won several James Beards Awards. She, she basically broke all records and she really was the person who kind of helped bring, um, she didn't have to hide her, her ethnicity and her race. She was like out in front, like a noted, amazing chef and historian. I say all that to say, what I'm seeing now happening in museums is I'm seeing, especially at historic sites, um, I'm seeing an increased interest in the ways in which enslaved people, again, contributed to the shaping and narrative contributions of food and food ways. Um, not just in the South, but in across America. And it's sort of what uh, Ms. Fowler was saying before, 
the influence across the diaspora, right? Mm -hmm. um, what other museums are doing is being really careful to have um, gardens, having community programs that are uh, co-created programs that invite participation from communities so that community members can do potlucks, they can share recipes, they can make um, cookbooks. Um, you know, Catherine and I both are like huge fangirls of Brian Terry. If you have, if you don't have his book, his book is again, um, what is it? So much of uh, vegan soul. Uh, I think what an Afro vegan is another yeah, one. Yes, Afro vegan. Sorry, Afro vegan. But <clears throat> the, one of my favorite museums in the world is the Museum of the African Diaspora. I've been, I was started going from the first year that they opened. But one of the exciting things that they started doing <clears throat> is the executive director invited Bryant Terry to be its first ever chef in residence. So he is someone who um, promotes Afro veganism, but also promotes um, social justice and um, you know, awareness about, about the rights of access to land and fresh food. Um, he's really all about social activism and political change in food culture and food ways. And he's based there at the Museum of the um, African Diaspora or MOAD. One of his first programs was called Black Women, Food and Power. He brought together this, it was amazing discussion about, um, you know, with cookbook authors, with food justice activists. Um, he had another program that it was called the Diaspora Dinner. It was a multi-course dinner that really talked about the ingredients, um, preparation of food. It was there in the lobby of, of Moad. Um, someone else that you should be following is, again, Michael Twitty, who, I forgot the name of his book, but he's done this sort of journey where he's tracing, he's an um, Afro-Jewish gay man. He has traced his uh, food and cultural lineage he looks at the African diaspora. He does amazing programs across the country where he's actually sort of dressed in period clothing and he's cooking food in the open fire at historic sites. So there's so many things that museums can do to again, promote food literacy, uh, to promote food and land and liberation justice. And I look forward to working with both Ms. Filer and Dixie, hopefully to do some programming like that here in Gainesville yeah. But I'm really, really proud of all of the work that so many food color, uh, culinarians and historians are doing to not only, just like Ms. Fowler was saying earlier, to change the narrative about what is Southern food, about what is American food, and what is um, our food heritage and culture. So they're preserving food, they're changing and, sh and sharing and shifting that narrative. And it's really exciting to say. I think the last thing I'll say before my time is up, the one thing that I like to see all of us talking more about is the ways in which, um, particularly in the South, Southern food ways are so heavily influenced by migrant and immigrant cultures. We, we really need to be talking more about that. If you look at places like Charlotte, you have large communities of Latin, or just across the Carolinas, you have large communities of Latinx people where there was a time going up, you'd never see a taco truck. Now, not only do you see a taco truck, but you might be able to get a taco truck, grab some like pickled okra, maybe a cup of shrimp and grits, like that's Southern, right? If you go to places like Louisiana, you'll see this, and there's an entire new type of food that is via Cajun, right? You think about the ways in which uh, Cubans and Haitians and other folks from around the diaspora have, are contributing to the, the, the development of the ways in which we think about food here in the South, particularly as it relates to barbecue. So I also want to call out the name of Howard Conyers. If you're not following Howard Conyers, you should be following him. So I think I'll just leave it there. I told you I would geek out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We were, I was trying to put some of them into the chat, but the Jones text, I think we, you have a panelist who, I'm, I'm sorry, an attendee who wants the Jones book. Yeah. It's Cooking Jones by Jermaine Jenkins. Okay. I think you can probably buy it on the Fresh Future Farm website. And then the other book is uh, Vibration Cooking. And then you can just buy, there's multiple books by Edna Lewis. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Now, um, I think I'll turn it over to you, Ms. Fowler, and tell us more about the Cotton Club and its relationship to communities, Southern food ways and culture. 
Well, I just heard a lot of ways that we might incorporate into the Cotton Club Museum and Cultural Center. It is exciting. I think it's so exciting to hear you talk about the variations and the uniqueness and the impact and the strong flavor of all of this and what it means, but the children won't know unless folk like us at museums teach and others teach. We have to have a healthy, um, I think a healthy appreciation for the heritage in terms of all of the foods, but it specifically know that America started its food chain in terms of uh, the recipes that are made up out of these combination of the three. So that the, the African, African-American cook in the kitchen was able to combine these things. You know, they brought over from Africa the spices and the okra and those things. They didn't exist any place else. So we need to teach the children that a lot of children want to eat okra, but some of the other foods that came from, and we've done some of this before because we had some uh, um, foods that were indigenous to certain places and we held workshops and the children were able to see the food stuffs in their normal state and also to eat it after it was prepared. We haven't done much of this, we're only a year old, but the possibilities are great. And I love the fact that we probably should think about investing in a collection of cookbooks that you've, you have just told us about. Those would be good things to have on our shelves. They would be great to introduce to people who come to us and want ideas of where to go, but it certainly is certainly part of who our our um, culture at the museum uh, will take on as very important. Because not only I think should we talk about where we are and how it's evolved, but the fact that when we talked about the pig and all of that, the, all of the neighbors came together and spent the night killing this hog and God, I remember those awful nights because they had to fix the chitlins and all of that. Yep. And that was a work of art. My mother and those were just excellent at that. I hated it so much, but there was nowhere to go. I mean, we were going to be there and it's going to be done. I just like the end product. But that along with fishing, because fish became a big part of, of our diet and wringing that chicken neck, my mother could break it with one Thing. But, you know, I think building the history into the, the recipes so that the children will pass it on. I, I, I think there is too little of learning at the uh, footsteps of the elders because there are not enough elders teaching. And so the fill in will have to be those people like you great women who, who have done all of this work of us coming together to try to pull that uh, in for them. The children want to know. I believe they're anxious to know, and I believe they're great learners, and we have more tools to learn uh, to teach them with. So I think that's very important for them to do. I can't say that I know a lot about cookbooks. My mother was a pinch and a cup full, but it was always good. So I learned to cook that way. My husband on our 25th wedding anniversary brought me the, oh, a gorgeous cookbook. But then the cookbook had a area in it on how to cut the hog and what section of the, of the beef came from what, and it showed you how to slice it and where everything went. And, and, and at that time, we had to measure differently from what we measured now in terms of the salt and the pepper and the salt and the, the um, bacon powder for the baker and things like that. So now we buy all of that stuff incorporated a lot. But I agree with you, Portia. My mother could whip up a cake or two or three in the blink of an eye. And then when we just, at the end of a day, maybe we just didn't have anything to eat, she cooked up what she called a sweet bread. It wasn't exactly a cake, but it was, it was comfort. It was comfortable. My dad, uh, his recipe was, uh, he, he grew the, the cane, made the syrup. He and his friends had this great syrup. They made the syrup and then the leftovers, they made something called moonshine. I don't know if you ever heard that word before, but they really felt good about it. So then my dad, we stored the, it for the year now, we have our um, syrup. So my dad on a rainy day would make syrup cookies and then he would make the syrup uh, for uh, water for us to drink. And we'd sit around the fireplace and he would tell stories. 
And mm-hmm. that's, I think, is why I became a storyteller. Like, mm-hmm. just think of the rain beating down on the on this tin ceiling. And my dad had five daughters, and his, the daughter's surrounding him, and he's telling stories. So there's a lot of warmth in what we have to offer, but we can't, we, we need to teach that. And I believe that this is a magic way to do it. So I don't have a lot to contribute uh, other than that, but I'm, I'm excited to be on this panel. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Fowler. We mm-hmm. appreciate that. Mm-hmm. And um, to bring in Dixie um, to talk a little bit about the Matheson Museum and its relationship to Southern food and culture. Yeah. Well, I because of this panel, I had the good fortune to go over and spend a whole lot of time looking at the cookbooks that we have in our collection. And we have over 150 cookbooks. Um, most of them are are small, homemade. Uh, Some of them are actually stitched together by hand. Um, There's there's two or three of what I would call big cookbooks like Fanny Farmer or Betty Crocker, but those really do not comprise the heart of our collection. The ones that I like are I think we have a um, a fundraiser cookbook from every church in Alachua County, every school, uh, the firemen, the policemen, all you know, everybody. That it's the best way because everybody likes to cook. Everybody has to cook, so it's a perfect fundraiser. So it, it was really wonderful to spend some time looking through that collection. And I don't know if you can see this. This was, has to be my favorite book. And what you can see here, it's actually got fabric on the front, little um, dresses, of course, indicating who is supposed to be doing the cooking, but it's just totally handmade. And you can see the edge is held together by yarn. These are things that touch my heart. And um, in looking through them, I was reminded of the way that I figured out what my mother's favorite recipes were after she gave me her cookbooks. And it was just to look through them and find the most food splattered pages because that, and, and, and to seeing that and um, it reminded me of the moments that she was making. She wasn't a great cook, so she used cookbooks a lot, but, <laughs> um, it's just um, a wonderful aspect of the library that we have um, that's really all about Alachua County. So everything in, in our collection, not only our library collection, but our collection of objects um, in all of our buildings um, is right here from our home, from Alachua County. And we love that. Um, we love the fact that I always think this is the only museum in the entire world that's about you. It's about Alachua County. It's about the things that happened here. And and certainly homemaking and cooking and cleaning and setting the table. Those were all things that we learned and someone fortunately wrote them down so the rest of us can figure out um, how to do things. Thank heavens. (laughs) Um, We collect our cookbooks, we collect all of our objects from mostly from donations. We rarely go out and buy something for the collection, um, but we have a generous community and, and family members who eventually give us the things that they loved because they don't want these things to disappear. I can't imagine anyone throwing away a family cookbook. So if you don't have room for all of your family's cookbooks, thank heavens people think about donating them to places that will care for them, um, keep them in good condition and um, share them to allow these traditions to continue. So uh, I'm, I'm really happy that we have so many people that are so generous to us and to give us not only cookbooks, but um, letters from the community, uh, letters from their children in the service who've written home. Um, um, (laughs) 
uh, we have a lot of oral histories. We have a great connection with the uh, Sam Proctor oral history program. So we have these stories literally told by the people who lived these experiences. So um, it's, a, it's a very small museum and I just think it's a gem. It's a jewel of Alachua County. So I'm, I'm grateful to our community for their generosity and the things that they tell us when they come to bring us these objects. Um, they always want us to know everything that, you know, this belonged to my mother and she, she was a, a dressmaker and she did this and she did that. So we write all this down. We don't let any scrap of information escape. Um, and that gives us a very rich collection, I think. So, um, I, and, and as far as being a museum geek, Portia, I am with you all the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my husband's eyes kind of glaze over when I start talking about museums. <laughs> so it's really great being on a panel with like-minded people. <laughs> you got to call me, Dixie. We need to have a, a hangout. I agree. And I've got some <laughs> ideas that we can share. <laughs> all right. <laughs> great. Okay. Thank all of you all for these for these comments. I want to now bring in um, the rest of the, all of the participants that have shared their time with us. We have several questions. Um, and if you so choose, you can answer whatever questions you like. I want to pose the question along the lines of, um, as Dixie started at the end of her comments about the relationship, the, the history behind um, material objects, but also that speak to um, the relationship between the food and personal identity. And one of the questions was, how do you understand the ways in which food and recipes have impacted your personal identity? I mean, you walk in a lot of steps to make up for everything that I ingest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like I said, food has single-handedly probably been one of the things that has shaped me. I'm known because I like to cook. I'm known because my dad is a phenomenal barbecue master, chef, whatever you want to call it. Um, and like I said, all of my formative years, especially, are just shaped by nothing but food memories. I, I, I hardly have any memories growing up, even through high school, that are not shaped by food and food ways recipes, like I said, harvesting food, working land. We, my grandfather, my grandmother, like I said, had her own, she called it her garden, but it was acres. And so did my grandfather outside of his tobacco fields. My grandfather would grow fields full of cantaloupes, the different types of melons, squash, you know, um, all kinds of things that we help to harvest sometimes. So I, I just, my identity is, is fully shaped as a Southern black woman by food. I just can't escape that. Okay, well, I, I certainly agree that food uh, does have a major part of identifying who I am. I can remember back in the olden days when we talk about uh, picking peas and shelling the peas and the women getting together. There was one yard in the neighborhood, there would be five or six mothers there with bushels of peas next to them with a pan in their lap. And they're doing this, their fingers are moving like they're on fire. I've never seen anything like it. They shell peas and they would do five, 10, 20 bushels. And while they're doing that, their kids are off in the dirt playing hide and go seek, or they're playing ball there. They're doing something. So the children are taking care they are having a, a family community, a, a, a community talk, a sharing, or getting together, and they're preparing food. They're mm -hmm. getting this ready because they're going to can it. They're going to put it away so that it is ready for the winter when they're when it is not available on the vine. So I can always remember looking on the shelves and seeing black eyed peas, white white acres with the top of the list, white acre peas and. Uh, okra and tomatoes, those things in what we call can, they were actually in jars. So the, the mason jars, after the mason jars were used, they became uh, useful in the kitchen. Uh, I can remember my mother, uh, other association was my mother took what was called the college in. At the time that Steve Spurry and Gatorade and all those things were coming along, Steve Spurry, my mother 
famous saying is that she fed Steve's Burrier. She was actually in the kitchen cooking then at the College Inn, which also is the first site of picketing by the student organization who started the civil rights movement here in Gainesville. So that kind of connection we have as well. I told Steve Spurry that story a couple of months ago and we took a picture together, but uh, there is just so much. If you're in the South or if you're around where food is grown, you, you manage to be a part of it across the spectrum of lines. You know, some of that food my parents uh, uh, prepared and set aside entered into white families' homes and entered into our cousin's home. And when somebody came through and didn't have enough, was packed away and sent along with them. So I love the fact that uh, when we, when our families were together, not on, it, when you became a certain age, you had to learn to shell those peas. So you were no longer going to be over there playing hopscotch. At a certain point, you had to sit next to your mother and she'd teach you. But I was very proud of that because I wanted my fingers to move as fast as my mother's fingers did. And that means you could shell them Esther, but now I, I I almost fainted when I saw people with a knife cutting down the side of a pea to get it open because I just thought that was hilarious. But food does mean a lot to me and it has played a pivotal part in my life. And obviously I'm working so hard to get off this pandemic food that I've worked myself into since I've been closed up in this house with food. So it does me, because I love it. I mean, I love the different ways that it's prepared. I love to cook, but I also love to eat what I cook. So I love to see others. I love the pleasure on other folks' face. I like I like to look at them and see what impact it's making. Did I do it quite right or should they be? And my children now are famous because their friends come back. My children are old, like older than you guys. Their high school friends come to town and want to know that their mother has a lemon velvet. That was the cake they grew up on. Uh, so that that to ties us all together there. But uh, it, food is a very neat subject to talk about. Thank you. Miss Fowler, I, I want to transition to another question that's in the chat mm -hmm. as well. I think both you and Portia talked about um, the relationship both between um, spirituality and food and, and, and where, um, how food was meant to serve as um, caring for individuals, showing your care for individuals, um, whether they are sick and shut in, just to, so I just thought about you, you know, um, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about, it, all of you all, can you talk a little bit actually about um, more of the economics even behind um, um, giving food away versus um, one of the questions in the chat was about like the resurgence of farmers markets and talk about their value in terms of preserving uh, Southern culture through food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and not so much as selling, but exchanging. Yeah. Uh, I know there's a group in, in Alachia County called the Farmers Aid Board. They just celebrated their 100th year anniversary. And this is a group of farmers who lived near uh, off of 43rd, they had they owned all that land, by the way. They all of it's gone now, mostly, but they owned it. These farmers could not get uh, insurance to do different things. They would become ill and all, so they band together because they, they needed their each other's help. And they would harvest and they would glean and they would do all of these things with each other. And they had a little pot of money. They'd pay a certain amount, and if you were ill, you received food along with this little stipend of funds. And they still exist. They don't have the farms as they did then, but their tradition is important and carried on. And I think everybody should get to know them. I'd love to tell you more about them because that's the tradition that we're losing, the coming together of us all to make sure everybody's fed. So when we meet, there's one gentleman who still has his farm. If it's watermelon season, he has a truck full of watermelons. If it's corn, he has a truck full of corn. And you just go to the truck and, and fill up. But uh, at church on Sunday, not only would you have dinner, but people would bring things or open their fields up at the end of the year for others to glean. And by the time you glean from enough fields, you probably had a, the food that you needed. Uh, for that. And when there was an ill person, there was no nurse. So the person who went to care for that sick person also took the food for you, right? So that they could feed them and the, the next person. Mm -hmm. I, 
I, I have so much I want to say, but I think Catherine had a comment. No, um, just uh, real quick to insert, I um, it, this is a very exciting time. And then Portia, I totally want to hear what you have to say. Um, th this MOOC, because like you were saying, Ms. Filer, that it's we're losing stuff right now, but there's also this resurgence right now that's happening that's really exciting. People are getting more excited about local. People are getting more excited about regional cooking in a way that hasn't happened for a generation. I think we've lost a lot, but now there's this interest, like. Farming is actually a growth industry right now, which has not mm -hmm. been the case for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. So it is just a really cool moment. And then, yeah, Portia, on to you. So, I mean, I feel like we could talk for like another two hours and be good. Um, <laughs> there's so many things I want to say. I mean, first of all, and, and, and I don't want to, I mean, sometimes I wonder like, is what I'm saying particularly about the South, but I will just say from my own lived experience in the South, you share food as an act of love. Yes. And that's really what it is. I mean, it's an act of love. Even if you don't necessarily like someone, you know that your, your success and your, the, health of your, the health and vibrancy of your community is connected to how well someone else is. Mm -hmm. So I would mm -hmm. just say that, like it's food, uh, it's love. When I think about the ways in which um, people bring food to the repast, right? for our funerals and and we i was just having this conversation the other night where we were talking about i personally have now lost five people three people due to COVID during this time right and we were talking about and i've lost i had a friend a dear friend who lost her mother i've known so many people who have experienced a lot of loss i'm actually leaving for a funeral on friday and one of the things we've been talking about is the ways in which this pandemic has single-handedly destroyed and shifted our funeral behaviors, our funeral ceremonies and rites and our funeral rituals, right? So I'm thinking about people who pass, the way that you show that love is you bring delicious food to the repast, right? So that you, just like what Ms. Fowler is saying, you're looking at people, even in this moment of grief, they're experiencing a, a moment of connection and pleasure at eating this food that someone has prepared. The other thing I wanted to say is that, um, for me, far farmer's markets are not like a new thing, but I clearly see that there's this huge resurgence, right? Again, I've come from farmer, you know, farm people, agri you know, agrarian culture. So whatever you took, my grandfather would take, you know, this big truck loads of his cantaloupe to the state farmer's market, you know, yada, yada. But what I, what I would encourage everyone to understand, the reason why the resurgence of the farmer's market is so important is because you are protecting or you are supporting and protecting farmers, particularly if they are farmers of color who are historically and systematically excluded from grants. You know, most farmers of color are not big, big farmers. They don't have these overwhelmingly large, you know, industrial, whatever. They're just small, simple people. And if we don't, if we don't support them, um, they will, they will die out. The other thing I will say is, one of my one of my most saddest memories happened last summer when I was like went to the state farmers market and I'm like where are the seeded watermelons that I only could find one black man an elder black farmer who had driven like over two hours to come to the state farmers market to sell this giant truck of seeded watermelons that no one wanted. And he was selling his watermelons for like a dollar or two because no one wanted it. And this man had to be over 70. And I, I bought like legit, like a trunk full of watermelon. And then my goal was to go back. I just, I, my children and I literally called ourselves watermelon fairies and we went and delivered watermelons at everyone's house that we could think of. <laughs> but I say all that to say, what I'm also want people to think about is the ways in which if we don't support those local farmers, we're going to lose all of those seeds, the heirloom seeds, the seeds that are most critical, that are most important, these certain varieties that, you know, fall in and out of favor. We have to support that. The other thing I want to say is that, um, again, it goes back to the notion of like food literacy. If we can have access to clean, fresh food, we can teach ourselves how to prepare them. We talk about, you know, the recipes and all of that. Then again, we can continue to think about our safety, our health, our sustainability, and our liberation. And for all of us, regardless of race, that is 
that is so important because we see we're we're pumping our food with all kinds of things that are carcinogenic, that are stunting our growth, that is mutating our cells. We really have to get back to like the freshness of our food. So support local farmers and in particular support, uh, support local farmers of color because they are struggling. They really are because they have a lot of other challenges that people don't always think about. And eat, eat watermelon with seeds. <laughs> <laughs> I want to visit from the watermelon fairy. <laughs> awesome. I, I, there, there was about two other questions. We have about 10 minutes left, so I just want to pose one of them to get to our panel. I'm sorry, our attendees question. And it was more about um, other ways of collecting uh, recipes, cookbooks. And the question was, are there, are there recipes that are found in other material objects that you all have um, found and what would that what form does that take hmm. Hmm. like perhaps have they been uh, this person said you know maybe they were in diaries or diary archives or, are there other oh. Oh, okay. where people tend to be writing um you know Portia you were saying your mom put things in a box are yeah. there other material things objects that people are writing um about cooking in I would have to say my my gut is telling me that generationally we are not doing that. So folks like me, I, I guess I'm what am I a zennial? I don't know what I am. But um, <laughs> you know, we're into cookbooks and we go to farmers markets and we listen to trap music and yoga and all that stuff. Like that's our jam. But we're not writing down recipes per se. We live in a digital age. Everything is like if you write it, you know, people share. I mean, there's so many. Uh, you know, I'm thinking about all the food magazines, everything is digital, yada, yada. But I want to go back to something that Dixie said that I think is the, the, real, the real seed of the question that you're asking. We have to, particularly as um, historians and museum folks and, you know, academics, we have to really do a better job collectively of helping people to understand what is material culture. Because I will tell you, Dixie said, oh, I can't imagine someone throwing out a recipe book. I will tell you, people do throw out recipe books. Mm -hmm. People throw out recipe books. They throw out uh, diaries, yearbooks. They don't, they throw out meeting minutes. Mm -hmm. We don't mm -hmm. understand what is material culture because we don't teach um, historical literacy. So we mm -hmm. tell people that things that have age, things that are old, you throw mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. And we live in a very like disposable culture. So it's really our job to really start to teach people, inform people that the things that are written down, you know, we're talking about an entire generation that don't know how to write cursive. Like literally, not only can they not write cursive, they can't read cursive. Right. If you can't right. read cursive, you can't be a historian. That's and if right. you look at an object, you don't know what it is, you, you, you chuck it. Yes. That's like, that's really a crime. I mean, that's really uh, an injustice. And, and collectively and what we're what we're allowing to happen so I would yes. just say that like all of us collectively as participants and you know panelists we really have to I think have a, a put a goal and a mandate on ourselves to really teach people about what is material culture how how you actually preserve teach people how to preserve things you know my uncle was the grandmaster for the state of South Carolina for the Masons right mm -hmm. he called me in one day there was this there was this closet or office somewhere in one of the law in one of the lodges it had a lot of uh, water damage and mold and all that stuff. We found documents that were hundreds of years old, original proclamations that were rotting in closets, mm -hmm. uh, records that you know people just had. There was just boxes of stuff that people didn't know what to do with. Not only should we be preserving that physical culture, we should also be archiving things. So I just want to say that I don't know if it fully answers the question, but people are throwing away these things because they don't we don't give it a, a real sort of value. We live in a very Instagram culture. I love Instagram. There's nothing wrong with it. But we have to figure out a way to kind of blend those things, because in the next 30 or 40 years, people, what are we going to do? Go back and retrieve like cell phone data? I mean, we can but it's not going to be the same. Well, it's, you're right. There's a great divide. Uh, we, I, I say there are a couple of generations that weren't taught, so they can't teach. Uh, they weren't at the foot of their grandmother learning, so they can't teach what they learned there. 
So it is going to be our responsibility to try to bring that into focus. I have uh, I, my granddaughter and I made fruitcakes uh, last year and the recipe that I use, I received from a lady I call my godmother at church. And I wrote that down in 1958. Uh, some of you weren't even born then, but it's still, it's pretty brown looking now and it has a little splatters and all, but I refuse to throw it away. It, she said, grandma, look, it's so old. I said, yes. It's the original recipe that I wrote down, but you don't find many of those. And, mm -hmm. and so I will write that down so that it is clearer, but I intend to keep that uh, piece so that we might have it. When I was in high school years and years ago, there was something called the New Homemakers of America. And those teachers taught us to follow recipes. So they brought recipes. My teacher, I love, she's my shero to this day. And that was Miss Mabel Dorsey. She was such a diplomat, but her job was to teach us home ec, but she added on to it. And that's when I learned to appreciate a cookbook because my mother was not a cookbook person. Mm -hmm. uh, her recipes were great, but they were not written down. So when my, my daughter-in-law came into the family, she, I was fixing something one day and she said, well, mom, how you do it? I said, well, you put in a little bit and do that. And she said, the next time you make it, I want to be in the kitchen. So the next time I made it, she made me tell her and she wrote it down. Now, did you put that? How much of that did you do? And then I'd have to measure out what I did in the, in the palm of my hand so that she could write it down. And then she will have that uh, to pass on. It, it's a rich part of our culture. And I think we do have to pass it on. I would like to thank you so much, Ms. Fowler. I want to bring, I know we're kind of pressed for time, but I want to bring everyone's uh, attention to the comment by uh, Tawana Hodge. If you don't know Tawana, she's new to UF. She is an absolutely brilliant librarian. She's here serving in a new role as DEIA librarian, which stands for Diversity, Equity, Access, and Inclusion. She's mm -hmm. absolutely brilliant. And I want to, I think her point is so critical that some people don't think that their history deserves to be preserved or understood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's important. And also she is absolutely correct. When I tell people I work in museums, they're like, okay, well, what, what can you do in a museum? Mm -hmm. Or mm -hmm. uh, people, people ask, you know, technically I am what's called a cross pollinator. So I'm a librarian who studies museums, but mm -hmm. people say, well, what does a librarian do? Or what, what is an archivist? So that's, again, it's our responsibility to kind of better help people understand the role of our cultural heritage institutions in general and why they're so important. When I think about recipes in the modern context, I think about celebrities who, you know, pump their cookbooks or, you know, IG famous folks, or I think about these um, subscription home delivery, whatever that mm -hmm. gives you this recipe, but it's like a generic recipe. It's not like, you know, your grandma's recipe or your neighbor's recipe. It doesn't mm -hmm. have attached to mm -hmm. it all of that like history and legacy. So I think it is important. And again, we live in a very disposable time where people just think it's old, you chuck it. And that's really, we have to kind of get out of that, that mind frame. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for this. Uh, as people are saying in the chat, thank you for this amazing, lively panel. Um, and thank you for all of our participants for showing up, for um, being active participants as well. I'm going to hand this back over to Alexandra, who might have a few closing remarks and reminding us of the next event. Alex? Yes, hi. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate the conversation. I think we learn all so much about certain cuisine. We learn a lot about cookbooks, um, what the importance of cookbooks, and also how they need to be preserved, right? And especially, I agree with what you mentioned, Portia, that sometimes we don't know that her history needs to be preserved. Like we don't know um, of what Twana actually said, because that is definitely true. Because all the things that sometimes is orally passed down, so sometimes we're like, oh, since I know it, then I know this is what needs to be done. But sometimes we don't take the time to talk to our elders. Um, so we can actually retain those valuable resources that they have, valuable knowledge that they actually have acquired over time. And we definitely need to do a better job in preserving those legacy and history. And also, if, you have, if you're from Gainesville, you have cookbooks, please, you can definitely donate them. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> we have museums, and they're also interested to showcase um, cookbooks, especially that we have in Gainesville, and I definitely enjoyed our particular conversation. And, and this is pretty much what Conversation in Neighborhood is all about. So it's about food, where we actually have different topics. 
And our next topic actually is gonna be about food access, where we're gonna be discussing um, the intersection between race, class, and the environment, and also what does it mean, right, in terms of food policies in Gainesville. So on that note, I wanna thank everyone. I wanna thank Delia for actually moderating this panel, Portia, Vivian, Catherine, and Dixie for joining us today and for, for having this wonderful conversation. And thank you the participant for joining this Tuesday at 6.30 PM to listen to, uh, to that particular conversation as well. And, and this is the end of Conversation in the Neighborhood. Thank you so much. <laughs>